and activities. So understand addiction is a purposeful, goal-oriented activity. The goal, the purpose of an addiction, yeah, we got Cottage Grove, it's happening. Is that what you're checking? Can they hear you? Yes, she says. Oh. Yeah, you're getting mic signal? Yeah. Okay. And, and you heard her? Yes. Okay. Well, she's, she indicated that it's happening, so. Okay. Yeah. Can she ask you questions? She can. So all she has to do is press the mic. She knows that, right? She does. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. The purpose of an addiction is to an ob obscure an emotional process, positive or negative. Now, right away, this is psychology speak. Okay, you have emotions, right? And they're like a river. And part of this river is that it, it moves. It's not the same river twice. It just keeps moving, right? It's a process. And so that's how we talk in psychology that obscuring means you're hiding the process, whatever the process is for working it out. Now, water is pretty much irresistible. It wears down rocks, it wears down continents, but you can change the condition, you can freeze it, but it'll, the river is still moving, if, even if it's frozen, even if the top of it is frozen. So to an obscure, the purpose of an addiction is to obscure an emotional process, positive or negative. Now, it's easy to understand why people would want to cover up pain. That's pretty straightforward, right? But it's less easy to see why would somebody cover up feeling good? Guilt. Well, guilt, right? And because somebody told you you don't deserve to be any good things because you ain't, sorry, there ain't no way of saying this, but shit. So if somebody telling you you ain't shit, then you're going to feel guilty about feeling good because the, some person told you that you ain't shit. Now, probably the reason that they're telling you you ain't shit is they don't feel like they, they're just passing on what happened to them. But that doesn't excuse it, but you, that helps you to understand why they're doing it. But if you take on that stuff, then it still feels bad, and so every time you feel good, you will use or do some other process to obscure that good feeling. So both things are happening. So I can tell you this as a therapist. Both things are happening, and you just got to figure out what it was that's causing you to feel that way, right? So the purpose of an addiction is to obscure an emotional process, positive or negative, and that's why it's a goal-oriented activity, to cover that up. So it's like you could put a dam on a river but, you know, like, notice that beaver dams don't stop the flow of the river. The water still, it just slows it up. The water still flows through the beaver dam. Because the beaver just wants to make a pond for other things and itself. Right? Humans make a dam to stop the flow of the river, and the river is going to, like, flow over the dam unless you have a spillway. Right? Controlled but that kind of messes it up for the salmon and all that other kind of stuff. But it, you know, obviously this analogy gets stretched. But. So the idea is emotions are like a river. You can dam a river, but the water always finds a way through, over, or under. Or knocks the dam down. The dam might break, and then all of a sudden, you got a crisis downstream. So addiction is kind of like putting a cover over the dam and the river. Out of sight, out of mind. Not feeling. So one of the things we look for, especially, um, there are several things that your brain is designed to do because bad stuff happens. And it's designed to basically block that stuff so you can survive in the moment. This definitely happens in combat. You don't have time to think about the fact that your friend just got blown up. They're shooting at us. Get out of the way, or whatever. And then you can grieve your friend later, maybe, when you're outside of the war. Maybe. Because you might not want to look at it because it was so horrific. Or any kind of trauma.
So, pills are not skills. Okay? Emotions, feelings, wounds, trauma happen, and they have to be healed consciously and thoroughly. All right? So, if you do the analogy of a wound, like you get a cut, is it a paper cut? Is it a, you're cutting onions? Deep, you know, gushing? Is it a burn? What kind of degree of burn is it? Is it, you know, do you break a bone? Is it a bruise? It has to heal properly. Each wound, according to first aid, has to be healed properly. Emotional wounds are like that. But first, you have to acknowledge that they're there and heal them properly in the time that it takes to heal. Then, if it's properly healed, it becomes a memory and you can laugh at it, treat it humorously. You know, we talk about, uh, let's see, what's the phrase in English? Black humor or gallows humor or whatever. Or in the blues among African Americans, we say it's laughing to keep from crying. But, yeah, sure, I can laugh about having... Uh, yeah, you know, my first racial event, and so obviously my wounding, my first wounding came in Disneyland. When, in 1962, when you could still smoke in the park, this white guy puts a live cigarette in my hoodie and walks away. And the hoodie caught fire. All right? Now, what kind of person does that to a kid in the Alice in Wonderland teacups in Disneyland. Like, wow. I mean, well, actually, you would think Pirates of the Caribbean would be a better ride to abuse children in, but ha, 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 right? <laughs> but it didn't exist then. So that night, my parents, you know, told me about Emmett Till, which this kid gets lynched for whistling at a white woman. Well, actually, it wasn't li whistling. He actually put, well, he's paying for penny, can penny candy. He's from Chicago, and the way you deal with it in Chicago is when the person puts out their hand for the payment, you put it in their hand. But this was money, Mississippi, in 1955. So he, being from Chicago, put the money in her hand. She jerked away because she didn't want to be touched by a black person. And he, being 15, just thought that was funny and basically just whistled at her as he's walking out of the store and see you later, baby. And, and his cousins were like, you did that? So they went and hid. And they came and got him two nights later and killed him. All right? Now, that was the story that my parents told me at seven to deal with because that was my first experience at what, white people don't like me? Not all white people, just some. Well, how do you tell the difference? I mean, the people, the old ladies next door that give us Easter candy and Christmas presents, and no, they're cool. But the kids that I play on the playground, it's, no, they're cool. Well, <laughs> well, then who? Right? So, but that's a lot to wrap your seven-year-old mind around. But in black psychology, you deal with, you tell the kid about what's going to affect them as soon as it does, and you deal with it just like at an adult level. Now, some people don't deal with that, but don't think that that's okay. But I'm the son of a black psychiatrist, and I've read the literature that says you the kid is capable of forming the question, you give them the answer that you know to be true. And they'll figure it out themselves. You don't hide it. You don't sugarcoat it. Right? So, I mean, that's hairy stuff. And now I can joke about it and, you know, write about it and all that kind of stuff. It's not a wound now. But, you know, what are your traumas? What are, you know, your things? And you know, when I talked about, you know, the woman who had been sexually abused and racially abused by her stepfather, but didn't have, wasn't allowed to deal with that in treatment. Okay, there is a proper way of dealing with it, and that is deal with the, the wound and heal it until you can laugh about it. Because then it's not running you. Because you can let it go. 
Yeah, wasn't that stupid? I built a go-kart and uh, the wheels came off and I had to brake and you know, you can't really see the scar anymore. But it got almost, it was bad. Then, road rash. Now I can laugh about it because it can heal. So I'm, I'm telling you that, all right, you've got to emotionally heal that the wound correctly. Now, medications block the feelings so that you can temporarily function through a crisis. That was the original theory about giving somebody Valium when they have one of the five major stressors. And we'll talk about the five major stressors if you don't know what those are. But, you know, I think there's more than five. But, okay? The idea was we give you Valium to get you through the three weeks of the rough patch. And then after that, you don't need the Valium no more. Because you will read in the physician's desk reference that med ordinary stresses and strains of life should not be treated with Valium. Yeah, well, why are the doctors giving that out like Skittles? Hmm. So I'm saying there is a place for medication. But the medication doesn't give you the skill of dealing with experiencing the raw, unshielded factors of life by, by itself. Now, if your culture gives you a way of dealing with the stressor without the drug, that's great. Well, this is America, and we don't do that very well, because it's a young culture to the degree that it's a culture. But that's, and that's what I'm saying, you know, say when I said, oh, you want to heat yourself up? Breathe through your right nostril. I mean, so that's 7,000-year-old science. That's older than Western civilization. Oh, try your triple warmer meridian. That's acupuncture. It's older than Western civilization. Does it work? Oh, eat a cayenne capsule. Drink a cup of coffee. Whatever. All right? So, medications block the feeling so you can temporarily function through the crisis, but they're not the skill of being functional in a crisis. They're not. So, you can use skills along with your pills, but pills alone won't build your self-mastery. You have to master yourself. So you have to, um, like uh, the group Floetry talked about, inner, inner stand, understand, and overstand. So inner stand is to feel it first. Understand is to be able to think through it. What's happening to me? What am I seeing here? And overstand is to know on a deeper, uh, no other English word for this, but a soul level. What happened to you? to understand how this event connects you to your strength and feel it. Understand, understand, and overstand. So, otherwise, if you're not able to do that, you'll self-medicate using addictive substances and or processes. Veg out on the tube, overeat salted peanuts, or whatever your thing is. So, point of clarification. <clears throat> and now, I haven't said this yet, but I'll let you know. It's not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. Now, this came out of a friend of mine who's an African-American substance abuse therapist who was running 
uh, an African-American treatment center in Portland oriented towards treating African-American women because even though she was a black 12-stepper, she believed that you had to deal with trauma. And since black women were dealing with racial trauma and mainstream 12-steppers don't believe that racism exists or racism is a, a proper subject for trauma, no, we're addressing that here in therapy using state dollars. We are addressing that. And so white women who also found problems, you know, they were sexually abused, but some 12-steppers wouldn't want to deal with their sexual trauma were coming to this black treatment center and getting clean and sober. And so basically, the, she, you know, she said, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. When you look at the DSM, it's now uh, 4R, because it's being revised in the new edition, the fifth edition is coming out next year. Okay, you look at the, the diagnoses, and they're very good at describing what the problem is. <clears throat> but I'm sorry, the solution to sexual abuse trauma cannot be Prozac alone. <laughs> so yeah, that gives you an excuse for prescribing a drug, but you also need to bring in the talk therapy to talk the problem through. And that's what we were supposed to do, talk, talk therapy and medication to get you through the rough patch. But what if the rough patch, you're still in it? We still give you the skills to talk it through, but the pill, right now we're just doing the pill because training people to talk to people is expensive, more expensive than the pill. No, shouldn't we be healing it correctly? Sorry about getting started, but there it is, right? So it's not what's wrong with you. The diagnosis is what happened to you. All right? So PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, really bad stuff happened to you, and you stuffed it because your brain is designed to actually stuff really bad stuff so you can survive it and get out of the situation. Now, once you're out of the situation, actually you continue to stuff it, especially when there's something that reminds you about it. And the remind you part can often work in strange ways, ways that you wouldn't necessarily think. I'm gonna pick on you for a second. Do you mind? What's your name? Jeffrey. Jeff. Ask me why fire engines are red. Why are fire engines red? Well, Jeffrey, the type of fire engine we're talking about, if it's Eugene, they're red. So fire engines are red because... Let's see, why are fire engines red? Let me see. I'm blanking. Well, the type of fire engines we have have... Two, four men, and three ladders, right? Just say right. Okay. Okay? So everybody knows that three times four is 12. Right? Yeah. And there's 12 inches in a ruler. That's true. And Queen Elizabeth, she was a ruler. She was. And she had ships that sailed the sea. That's true, too. And in the sea, there are fish. Yes. And the fish have fins. Mm -hmm. And the fins fought the Russians. They did. <laughs> And that's why fire engines are red, Jeffrey, because they're always Russian. Oh. Ah. 